Hey everybody, and welcome to our next video for food chemistry, which we are going to talk about um, some differences between changes that could occur in the kitchen. So if we take a look at these two scenarios, so this image on the left, we have bread that's toasting. So I put bread in a toaster, it comes out, it's got a different texture, it's got a different smell, it's got a different color. Something clearly happened, it changed. Whereas on this smaller picture on the right hand side, I've been obsessed with these little like little drink mixes. I'm on water TikTok for somehow and uh, all these people make these different waters. So I've been buying all these. But anyway, you get the sugar packet and you have water and you add those two things together. There's a certain classification of a change that has occurred and that change is actually quite different from the change that occurs when I cook bread or when I toast bread. So what is the difference between these two types of changes that we can encounter in the kitchen when we're cooking? And the first type of change that we could see is called a physical change. And a physical change does not produce something that is totally new. So I have two different or more than two different things and I put them together or I change them in a way, but I didn't make anything entirely new. So for example, the drink mix situation. So I have a glass of water and I have some of those Starburst little drink mix. It's like a concentrated sugar. I put the sugar in the water and what do I get? I basically get sugar water, right? This is what we call an example of a physical change. The reason why it's a physical change is because that glass of that liquid, that glass of that drink still has water in it. There's still water molecules and it still has those sugar molecules. All we did was they were mixed together and they created something that's a combination of the two. Okay. So both of those two substances still retain their own properties. That's more of like a chemistry way of saying it. I didn't produce anything new. I still have water and I still have the sugar, but I added them together and I have some combination of those two things, but I have no totally new substance. So another example, if I am grating cheese, I have that big block of cheese at the top and I grate the cheese using a box grater, that grated cheese still has the exact same chemical composition. All I did was I changed the size of the cheese particles. That is another example of a physical change. After it went through that process, it's still cheese. Physical change. If I am mixing together cake batter, so in this case, I have a cake batter mix. So let's say I have the box, whatever's in there, and I add some eggs and I add some oil and I add some milk, whatever is needed to make the box recipe, and I mix them together. All of those things are still in the batter, right? I didn't make anything totally new. There was no indication of a chemical change. And what we're going to talk about in the next type of change is what would tell us if there was some sort of chemical change that occurred. I didn't produce anything new in this case. I simply just have all of those ingredients mixed together. Here's another example if I am boiling water. So I have a pot of water on the stove and that water starts to produce steam. This is also an example of a physical change. Why is that? Because the water in the pot is liquid water, H2O molecules, and the vapor is still also H2O molecules. All that changed is the amount of energy that those particles have, but the H2O molecules in the liquid are the exact same as the H2O molecules that are in the vapor. So that is also a physical change. Whenever I go ahead and I go through a phase change, so whether I'm freezing something, if I'm melting something, if I'm vaporizing or condensing, whatever it may be, it's always going to be an example of a physical change. I'm not making anything totally new than what was there previously. On the other hand, we can also have a chemical change. And a chemical change is when you produce a totally new compound that wasn't there before. So if I look at the toast example, you have bread, you put it 
into a toaster, that toaster gets hot, and you start to notice some changes within that toast. It starts to get very hard. Its texture changes. Uh, this, you'll start to smell it, right? You can smell when toast is, when bread is toasting. Uh, the color starts to change. Hopefully it doesn't get too dark because then it actually starts to smell bad at that point. But there's all these different pieces of evidence we can use that tell us whether a chemical change has occurred. And here are just some of the many examples. I think these are the most prominent ones that we'll find in the kitchen. So how do we know that a chemical change has occurred? Well, we can have a change in smell. We can have a change in taste. Normally we don't taste things in the chemistry lab, but this is food chemistry. So if we were in a regular kitchen, we could assume that since taste is changing, that the chemical composition is also changing. Change in texture, change in color. And also if it produces a gas, right? If we're producing a gas that wasn't previously there, that indicates that I've produced something new that wasn't there previously. For example, if milk goes sour, I spared you all from actual spoiled milk. I just found this guy that was smelling something instead. But this milk has gone bad. The process of milk going bad indicates a chemical change. Why? Well, we have a lot of indicators that tell us that a chemical change has occurred. One, the smell changed. It went from smelling like milk to smelling really bad. The texture, texture changed. It went from a liquid to a very clumpy liquid, really nasty. Texture change and the taste will change as well. So hopefully you've never drank spoiled milk. But um, I would assume, because I have never drank spoiled milk either, but it does have a very, very sour taste to it. All of those pieces of evidence has, indicates that a chemical change has occurred. If I'm frying up bacon, this also will tell us that a chemical change has occurred. How do I know? Well, for I'm applying heat to this. And applying heat is one way to kind of get a reaction started especially in the kitchen. When I'm making bacon, we have a change in smell. I'm not gonna move my picture because you can still see it. We have a change in smell, we have a change in texture, and we have a change in taste, okay? And this particular reaction, we are going to talk a lot about towards the end of this unit because there is the chemistry, the food chemistry reaction. It's called the Maillard reaction. And bacon is a great example of the Maillard reaction in action. And actually, so is toast, um, has the Maillard reaction when that cooks. So if I am brewing beer, right? A lot of people think beer is just, you know, something that you just drink on the weekend and you have a lot of fun with. Beer is one of the most complex types of chemistry that you can do. There are so many types of beers and there are so many flavors that go into beer. And that process is a very intense chemical process. If you ever get a tour at the brewery down the street, you'll see that it's basically a giant chemistry lab, okay? And what they can do to make beer is they'll take yeast and they'll take um, some sugar solutions, right? And that particular reaction produces a gas. So I wanted to show you this one because we could see all these little bubbles that's in here. The production of beer or any type of alcoholic substance produces ethanol. Ethanol is the actual alcohol component and it produces carbon dioxide. Those little bubbles that we see are all carbon dioxide bubbles. And I wanted to show you this one because this is a great example of the production of the gas as a result of a chemical change. So here are the um, examples. So production of a gas, we have a change in taste and we have a change in smell that could result from the production of beer or wine even. Cause actually when you make wine, there's a lot of carbon dioxide that comes out of that as well during the fermentation of sugars. So let's do some together, right? So now it's your turn. Let's identify these five processes as either physical changes or as chemical changes. The first one is if you are whipping cream. Whipping cream is what type of change? Whipping cream would be an example of a physical change. And that is because if I have cream, you take heavy cream and you whip it up. I have a nice little immersion blender with a whisk attachment to it. 
blends it up real nice or whisks it very nice. All you're doing is you're adding air to that and it's making it nice and fluffy. So whipping cream is a physical change. How about if you are making bread? So here an is an example of like a sourdough starter and the process of making bread. What type of change would this be? Making bread would be an example of a chemical change. And that is because as you can see in the starter that's over there on the left, we have all those carbon dioxide bubbles. When I have the dough and I put it in the oven and I get the bread, the texture is changing, the smell is changing. I have a lot of changes that are going on. In fact, it's actually raising in height. That's a result of carbon dioxide gas bubbles being released from the bread so solution, the bread dough. And uh, that's why I have all those little pockets in the bread right there is because that's where all CO2 was formed in the baking process. Let's say you're grilling some vegetables. What type of change would this be? This would be an example of a chemical change. So if you look at those little grill marks, right, it's changing color at those points, you're also changing a lot of flavor components as well. And uh, you could also change the texture depending on, you know, what type of vegetable it is that you are grilling. For the most part, though, I think the color changes, hopefully not too much that you're burning it, but you also have a ton of flavor molecules that are changing as well before and after. Let's say you are making a salad dressing. So typically to make salad dressing, you need oil and vinegar. Sometimes you can add some garlic and you can, or like shallots and like honey or something like that. Making a salad dressing, what type of change would that be? This would be an example of a physical change. And that is because when you make that salad dressing, you have all of those ingredients and you whisk them together. All of those ingredients still exist. I didn't make anything new. I didn't form a totally new compound from the ingredients that were used to make the salad dressing. They all still exist, but they exist in harmony to hopefully make something quite delicious. One more for good measure. Making jello, what type of change would this be? Although we don't have a change in flavor and we don't have a change in color, we do have a very significant change in texture. So making jello is an is actually an example of a chemical change. Let's look at why this is a chemical change. So I found this image online. And this is how to actually make jello. So if you have some type of gelatin, right? Um, or if you have some collagen, typically this would be in your actual jello mix. You heat it up, you are breaking apart those different um, bonds that are in that original jello material. And when you cool it back down, these different proteins are actually bonding together into a new material. So because I'm creating bonds, that is in fact going to be an example of a chemical change. The structure, the chemical structure of that jello changes. And therefore I am changing the texture quite significantly when I make jello. We are going to do some practice with this in class. I have a stations lab where you're going to do a bunch of different things and identify the physical and chemical changes at each station. Um, if you have any questions, as always, let me know. But otherwise, I will see you in our next video. Bye.